If you were the king of pleasure, and I were the queen of pain, you're very handsome, Miss King. Yeah, well, if there's one thing I know about, it's repressed lesbianism and the theatre. Hi guys, welcome to a video. In today's video, I'm just going to be reviewing Tipping the Velvet. Instead of reviewing popular up-to-date shows requested by my audience, I like to do the opposite. Yeah, I actually watched Tipping the Velvet many, many years ago when it first came out and I was a, just a young, closeted, homophobic, lesbian child. I still ate this show up as a gay kid, I was just homophobic and... I don't want to get too off topic, but there's definitely some truth to the notion that a lot of homophobes are actually just secretly gay because what's the obsession with gay people, you know? That is just... it's gay. <laughs> if you're not familiar with Tipping the Velvet, it's a TV adaptation of the book of the same name by Sarah Waters. It's set in 1890s England and follows a woman named Nan Astley who meets the acquaintance of a one Miss Kitty Butler, a popular male impersonator and music hall star. Nan soon realises that she's attracted to women and the pair eventually become a double act both on and off the stage. This is until Kitty breaks it off for the safety of a traditional life in marriage and broken-hearted Nan, in her guise as a male impersonator, takes to the streets to survive and finds a niche in the Victorian sexual underworld. Dot dot dot. I will just say right now, I think this show still holds up after all these years and I think it's really interesting to watch this show with a more educated adult eye. Especially in relation to a lot of the themes it explores, such as class, gender and sexuality. Tipping the Velvet is unique in comparison to a lot of other lesbian shows because it unapologetically explores masculinity, male drag and it portrays just how threaded into lesbian history this is. Of course, not all lesbians are masculine, butch or androgynous, but there's quite a few who are and it's nice to see that explored on screen so boldly. It's a very rich show aesthetically and it's worth watching for some of the costumes alone. On top of that, I forgot just how explicit this show was. I mean, it's not PG-13, girl, it's not. I also forgot just how camp this show was. It's like a parody of itself in some ways. There's actually a French and Saunders sketch of Tipping the Velvet, which is supposed to be a parody, but it may as well just be one of the episodes of the original show because the vibes are exactly the same, just with a very handsome Jennifer Saunders. All of the acting in this show is just 100% and I think with Tipping the Velvet, because of how gritty, explicit and absurd it is, there has to be a kind of commitment from the actors, otherwise it just wouldn't work. I had also forgotten that Benedict Cumberbatch and Sally Hawkins had roles in this show and it was a pleasant surprise. I mean, I love Sally Hawkins. I've, I've said it before and I'll say it again. I love her. So my favourite character in Tipping the Velvet is Diana Leatherby. I mean, what a name, Leatherby. Who doesn't want to be taken in by a rich older woman and uh, screwed senseless? Isn't that basically what The Price of Salt was also about? It's just, it's a dyke thing, you know? And Diana is so rich and she's so awful but it's so attractive. Her relationship with Nan is so tumultuous and emotional and toxic. It's just, it's delicious to watch. However, I think the relationship between Nan and Kitty is probably the most relatable on the show and probably my favourite. It was very toxic, but like I said, it was also relatable, even in today's standards, because heteronormativity is so persuasive and destructive. It ruins so many relationships between women. It, it just does, and it was very easy to relate to Nan in those moments where she had her heart broken by Kitty and she was let down and yeah. I also think Nan and Kitty had the most chemistry. I really enjoyed their scenes together. You could just tell that they enjoyed each other's company. But I also think that Nan made the right choice with Florence in the end because you know she can be trusted, whereas Kitty, not so much by her track record. And it's heartbreaking when Kitty comes back to Nan at the end because in a lot of ways, Kitty was the great love of Nan's life. But she didn't put Nan first and I think a lot of us wonder what would happen if that one person who you 
loved so intensely but had treated you so badly. You wonder what would happen if they ever came back to you and if you take them back. And the scene was heartbreaking because you know Nan wants to but she also knows not to. Now I wonder, because I admittedly haven't done my research and I don't want to embarrass myself by making assumptions, but I wonder how much of Tipping the Velvet is based on historical lesbian records. Clearly research has gone into its creation, but I'd be curious to know what Water's inspirations were in a lot of ways, because lesbian history is notoriously difficult to research. Tipping the Velvet is fiction, of course, and there's artistic license taken for entertainment. But the way that some of the lesbians are portrayed in this show is so predatory and perverted. And I'm not saying I didn't enjoy it, I just wonder if there's any truth to some of what she's created. And if there is, where can I find it? Strictly for historical research purposes, of course. Overall, I love Tipping the Velvet. I think it stands the test of time and honestly, it's such a rare piece of lesbian content which isn't afraid to go there. And then some. It just doesn't stick to the rule book and it's not afraid to explore all the grittier aspects of human beings and sexuality. And as a piece of entertainment, it's just, it's fantastic. Okay guys, if you've seen Tipping the Velvet, let me know what you thought of it down in the comments section. Don't forget to subscribe for instant disappointment. And I'll see you guys soon. Bye.